Tonight, um, thirsty for home is uh, if you want to write it down. That's what we're we'll talking about this evening. Is thirsty for home. Um, I spend a lot of time at this church, and I spend a lot of time in my office. And uh, there's a lot of times I just want to go home. Amen. I like going home. Yes, thank you so much. I'll leave. back there. Um, I like going home. I don't know, there's a lot of people that don't like going home. I, I like home. Uh, I like going home to my wife and my children. Though my children do drive me crazy at times. And I still like going home because they're my children. And uh, I love them. And I like going home. And there's a lot of times I'm in the office and, and I tell God, God, I just want to go home. You know, but there's not a time clock back there. If you've ever passed a church, buddy, and knows this, there's not a time clock back there. And when God's dealing with you, you stay till God lets you go home. And, uh, and as long as God is talking, I'm listening. And I'm trying to write and, and write stuff and get stuff and dig stuff out. And as long as God is talking, I'm trying to listen. Sometimes God talks faster than I can listen. It's the truth. And I have to say, slow down. Let me write it down. And, I, and there's a lot of times that I just I want to go home. And uh, how many of you have ever just wanted to go home? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. It's been homesick for home. Yeah. If you've ever, uh, the job that I have, uh, I drive a lot. And uh, I'll just give you an example. Uh, Friday, I uh, went to Ada, dropped my stuff at Walmart, came back and worked at the women's meeting thing and tried to do what I could do over there. Went back to Ada, went to Tishomingo, went to two stores in Ada, back to Walmart, and then James was in the hospital. And, uh, and so I uh, went and talked, went, tried to go see him. They wouldn't let me see him, but Shirley came out and talked to me. And uh, and so, you know, they got home about 11.30. They got home about the same time I did. And I just wanted to go home. I did not want to go back to Walmart. I just wanted to go home. Tired. Just ready to go. And I'm just telling you, I tell you that for a reason, not for you to feel sorry for me. That, that's my choice. That's my job. That's what I do. And so I, I'm just letting you know. I don't, I'm not saying that. So you're like, oh, poor Billy Jim. That, that's not what I'm saying it for. There's just time, sometimes that you just thirst and hunger to go home. Uh, if you've ever been away from your home for a while, if you've ever been on a trip, ever been uh, away from uh, your family for a while, for an extended time, uh, you just want to go home. Uh, I, I've never lost a uh, relative as, as close as a wife or uh anything like that. I've lost a brother, but I've never lost a spouse. And But it seems like sometimes that you just want to go back how it was. I just want to go home. I just want to go where everything was comfortable. Everything was like it should be. Everything fit together. Everything was right. Everything was together. And I say all that to say this tonight. That I want to preach to you for just a few minutes about thirsty for home. And I, I, are you getting thirsty for home? What do you mean thirsty for home? Well, it'll make sense in a minute. Are you getting thirsty for, are you thirsty and hungry for home? I believe we're in the home stretch. I believe if we don't get, if we don't win the loss now, we're never going to win them. I believe if we don't have God transforming lives now, He's never going to be able to transform them because we I've got to go win the lost at whatever cost. If you have your Bible, turn with me to the book of Luke, chapter 15, starting with verse 13. It's the prodigal son. Very familiar. Very familiar. I preach it a lot because it shows the love of the father. It shows the love of the father and for the children that he has. And not many days after the younger son gathered all together, he took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. When he had spent all, he rose up, there arose a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him to his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough to eat, I'm sorry, to spare, and stop, and I perish with hunger. 
Harris said it. Go back. Thank you. I perish with hunger. Listen. All he said is this. There's a young man who took his inheritance already, wouldn't spend it on riotous living. Famine came. He was starving to death. He was feeding pigs. He would have eaten the pig slop, but they wouldn't even let him eat that. And he said, he came to himself and said, I want to go home. I want to go home. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, help me design to preach the word right. Let me do right. Let me be right. Let me say the right thing. Father, let me just, just anoint this message. I'm sorry, anoint it. Anoint the word. Anoint the message. Anoint the, the ear to hear. And Father, we give you praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Thank you, sweetie. Amen. He said, I just want to go home. I want to rewind. I want to go back to where it was. When it was when I, before I had taken my father's inheritance, I, I want to take it back to the starting point. I want to go back to like I'd never left before. Because there's so many, listen, there's so many of my father's hired servants that have bread enough to spare and I, come, and I, and I perish with hunger. He said, I'm dying here and I've got to get back to where I need to go. I just want to go home. If you've ever have been homesick, if you know what I'm talking about, you'll understand the concept of just simply wanting to go home. I just want to go back where my family is. I just want to go back to where I fit. I just want to go back to where I belong. And this young man said, I just need to go home. I just need to go to my father. I know I'm not worthy to be a son anymore. I know that. I, that's, that's, that's doesn't matter. I still want to go home. And he began to thirst and hunger for home. Amen. Even so much so that he, that he planned a, a little, whole little saying about what he was going to say to his father. And he made all this, all these wonderful, this wonderful speech. But he's no longer worthy to be called his son. David's one of your hired servants. And the father didn't even listen to what he had to say. He just said, shut up. Put a robe on him. I don't, want, I don't want to hear it. Shut up. Here, put a ring on his finger. Just shoes on his feet. Robe on him. Hugged his neck. Ran after him. Chased him down. Because the father, though he was separated from the son, still wanted his son to be home. So much so that he looked forward to him coming home. So much so that he desired his son to be back in his house. Amen. And so, though you thirst to go home and you think maybe there's no way I can go home. Maybe there's, I've, I've done too much wrong. I've, I've been to too many places. God doesn't care anymore. The Father doesn't care. That's a lie of the devil. The Father is looking for you to come home. I, I said to you this morning, I'll say it again. It's time for you to like you. It's time to, to quit letting all the junk in your life rule you. Yeah. To quit worrying about all the things that everybody's always told you that you are. And start remembering what God said that you are. Yeah. And it's time to come home. It's time to quit worrying about what the brother in the house is going to say, but just simply go home. It's time to quit worrying and, and putting all the doubt in your mind about what they're going to say about me. It's okay. It's time to come home. I'm thirsty for home. Maybe it's because of my work schedule. Maybe it's because of my life schedule. Maybe it's because of whatever it is that I'm just ready to go home. I'm looking for the rapture. Is anybody looking for a rapture? You better start looking for one. Because one's coming. I, it's amazing to me. We look for devils and demons under every bush, but we don't ever look for the rapture. The way I figure, if only a third of the angels got kicked out of heaven... For every one demon, there's two devil. For every one demon, there's two angels kicking the snot out of it. I, that's just the way I look at it. I don't know. Maybe I'm crazy, but I'm looking for His coming in the clouds of heaven. Amen. I'm looking for Him to come. I'm looking for a. I'm looking for an escape. Well, you have an escape mentality. You're right. I do. And so did Jesus. Jesus said, "How can you escape these things unless He comes?" I don't know. 
about you, but I'm ready to go home. I, I'm ready to see. I'm ready to see my brother. I'm ready to see people that I haven't seen. I'm not saying I want to die today, but I'm just ready. I'm prepared. I, I know the. I know the load that God has. has given me. I know the, the job he has given me and I look at it sometimes and go God, are you sure? Amen. Well, Amen. if you were standing up here, you'd say the same thing. Amen. If you were standing here looking out at me, you would say the same thing. God, are you sure? Not because you're not worthy, not because you're not good enough, but because the task is heavy. The task is great. The task is one, listen, but it is an honorable task. And so he said this, he said, I just, I'm just going home. I've, I've, I've wasted everything. I've messed my life up, but I just want to go home. In John chapter 19, verse 30. This is where you get the thirsty. John chapter 19, verse 30. Jesus, one of the, the first thing he said when he's hanging on the cross is, I thirst. And they gave him what? Vinegar mixed with guile. His first thing he said was, I thirst. Thirsty. Jesus knew he was going home. Jesus, for the first time, think about this for just a minute. Please get this in your mind. Get this in your spirit. In the book of Hebrews, it says Jesus was never separated. He has no mother or father. He is, he is the beginning. He is the end. He is from the first and the last. He, is, he never had a beginning. He, he'll never have an ending. He'll never be separated from us. And he'll never be separated from God. But if you'll look on this, at, that, at the cross, heaven drew a veil and God turned his back. And for the first time in his existence, he was all alone. I thirst. He knew he was going home. He knew that his separation from his father was a temporary thing. And he knew that for the first time in his life, for the first time in his existence, he was going to be separate from the father. And the father was going to allow him to go into the bowels of the, of the earth. And he, and he understood that I, I made a promise. I'll, I'll let you go, but I'm going to pull you out. Amen. And so he said, I thirst. And he was thirsty because he was getting ready to go home. When he said in, in 19 and 30, it says, and when Jesus therefore received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Then said he killed him. said he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. So if you look at that, after he received the vinegar, he said what? It is finished. It is finished. The correct one of the correct sayings that a debt has been paid that was owed to never be brought back to their charge. I don't know about your salvation today. I, you guys can fool me. But you can't fool God. Are you saying, yeah, okay, well, I can take your word for it. I can't make you come get saved. I can drag you to an altar that all you're going to do is fight me all the way. You're going to say some words that you don't mean. You're going to get up just so I'll leave you alone. But hear me. When Jesus said it is finished, when he said it's over, he was thirsting for home. He was ready to go because it is finished means now I can go be back with my father. And so hear me today, church. Please understand what I'm trying to get across to you. Is that it's time that we get thirsty for home. Thirsty for the for the coming of the Lord, because if we we'll get thirsty for the coming of the Lord, we will we will accelerate our evangelism. Because Jesus is coming, the rapture of the church is imminent. Okay, I don't know if we, I don't know if the church really believes that anymore. I don't know. I mean, you say that, and everybody goes, yeah. But I don't know if we really live our lives like the rapture can happen before we step out of this building. I don't know if we really live our lives that the rapture of the church can take place before I wake tomorrow morning. Do we really live our lives that, that, you know, in, the, in, the, in the fact that 
There's nothing left to be fulfilled for the rapture to take place. There's, yes, there's, fulfilled, there's things to be fulfilled for his second coming, but not for the rapture. Amen. Amen. Do we really live our lives expecting Jesus to come back? Yes, amen. Do we really live our lives expecting him at any time, at any second, in the twinkling of an eye? I don't know. I don't know about this new Christianity thing. Where it's okay to do some stuff and live some ways and I'm not going to get into it. But I just don't know about it. I do know that I don't like it. <laughs> I think you ought to be committed. I think you ought to give your life. For he gave his life. And I think that I think he ought to at least, he ought to at least be able to get your life out of it. And listen, he said, I thirst. And now there was yet a vessel and a full of vinegar. They filled the sponge with vinegar and put it, they put it on his hyssop and put it on his mouth. And when Jesus said, for it, receive the vinegar, he said, it is finished. I'm going home. It's finished. I thirst for home. Does that make sense to anybody? Matthew chapter 17, verse 17. Then Jesus answered his said, oh, faithless and perverse generation. How long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. Can you hear it in the voice? I'm ready to go home. Oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Father, I'm ready to go home. Can you just hear it in his voice? I'm ready to go. These people are driving me nuts. I'm, I'm ready to go. They won't listen to what I say. When I tell them to do something, they do the opposite. So Jesus says, how long do I have to be with you? How long do you tell you understand who it is that I am and who it is that you are? How long, how long, how long? Thirsting for home. Isn't it, it cool that the King of all kings, the Lord of all glory, he humbled himself and came down to be a, a man in the flesh? And every day he got up and wiped away their blind eyes. Every day he got up, he healed their lame. Every day he got up, he wasn't taken aback by our horrible sin in our life. But every day he got up and loved us. Every day he got up and wiped the tears from our eyes. Every day he got up and healed our lame, our sick, our poor. Every day he got up and did everything that God had ever told him to do. And I can't remember off the top of my head what the scripture is, but he said this. He said, Father, I've done everything you've asked me to do. I've not lost the one except for the son of perdition. And I can't remember that said, but I just know it's there. Trust me. Find it. He said, I've done everything you've asked me to do. And I have not lost one of them. Save the son of perdition, Judas. I have, I've, I've lost him. But every day he got up, thirsting to go home. Three and a half years he was on this people's planet. Three and a half years he served. Three and a half years he walked. Three and a half years he taught. Three and a half years he wiped blinded eyes clean. He, he opened, he unstuffed the deaf ears. He, he loosed dumb tongues. He, he, he changed it. He cast out devils and he, and he made the lame to walk. And for three and a half years, these men followed him. And Jesus said, how long, how long, how long do I have to suffer to be with you? I'm thirsty for home. Getting ready to go. Is anybody in here ready? Yeah. I didn't say you had to go today. I don't want to go today either. But I'm ready for home. I'm ready. I'm just as ready to go to heaven as if I was already there. I'm ready. As I step on burgundy carpet, streets of gold are in my future. As just as soon as I, I stand behind this wooden pulpit, Streets of gold are in my future. Gates of pearl, walls of jasper, a city four square. One wall goes from New York City all the way down to Florida. That's a pretty good wall. That's a pretty good length of a wall right there, made out of precious stones. Was it? John 17, 12. I was close. I didn't know. Hit me. So, us as a church, I preached to you, I know I'm off my schedule, but I've preached to you about walking with Christ for five weeks. Walking with the Lord.
For if we can't walk with the Lord, we have just lost our way. I'm trying to get it into your head, trying to get it into your spirit. The walking with Jesus is the optimate thing, opti op that word thing. That's it. That is the most important thing. Walking with Christ. If we can get to church to walk with Christ, we can get to church to go and lead somebody else to Christ. Aren't you tired yet? Aren't you tired of the struggle of trying to live one way and trying to do the right thing but trying to do it the way you want to do it instead of just doing it the way Jesus says to do it? Don't you get tired yet of struggling with each other? Don't you get tired yet of being tired? He will give you strength if you'll simply follow after Him. He will give you joy if you'll simply follow Him. He'll give you all these things, but you simply have to follow after Him. And the church, it seems as though it's easier to do what I think instead of what it says. Oh, that went over good. It's easier to do what I think I should do instead of what it says I should do. Sometimes it's... We get opinions from people because we know they think like we think. Instead of somebody opening up the Word of God and saying, this is what this says. So it pretty much is what we should do, don't you think? If Jesus told us to love our neighbor as ourselves, then don't you think it's a, probably a pretty good idea if I love myself so I can love my neighbor as myself? But what happens so many times, and, it's, and I, I never thought of it, I never saw it, and I said it this morning, but I'm going to say it again because I want to get this in your spirit. I don't want you to be haughty and puffed up, but I want you to love in you what God loves in you. Amen. Does that make any sense? Yes. I want you to love the very soul that God's placed inside of you. I want you to love the... Listen, I don't think you should... I don't think you should if you're sinning and living a, a life of sin, you shouldn't love that. But you should hate sin, but you should love you. Because Jesus loves you. And I can't love my wife if I don't love myself. Because I'll treat her like dirt if I feel bad about myself. And I'll treat you like dirt if I feel like I'm dirt. So what I'm trying to get across to you by saying that twice is this. If Jesus says I'm to love my neighbor as myself, if he says, I'm to love you as I love myself, then I'm supposed to love myself as Christ loves me. Amen. How does Christ love me? He loved me so much, he died for me. He loved me so much, he brought me, he, he crucified my sin and brought me back to life. I died in Christ, yet I live. I'm alive in Him. And so He saw that in me. What do you see in yourself? What is it about you that you just despise? <clears throat> Get over it. Amen. Forgive yourself. Yes, Cast it to God. Give it to Him. Give it to Jesus. But brother, that's easier said than done. I understand that. I, and this is, I, don't, I don't expect your memory just to go outside your head. But I do expect you to say, you know what I'm going to do? I'm thirsty for home, and I'm going to make heaven my home. And I'm going to give my life to my Lord, and I'm going to give him all that junk in my life. I'm going to pour all that stuff out of my life. I'm going to get it out because I can't live like this anymore. Amen. Wives, you're going to kill your husbands. Husbands, you're going to kill your wives. By putting all that junk and that stress on them. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not exasperated as you. I'm just saying. If 
we don't pour that stuff out, get that poison out, we put it on the ones we love. And the people that we love trying to keep us happy stress over every situation. Because if I'm around you, and I know this, that you are going to make her mad, then I have to show. And that stress puts that on me. And if I know Brother Bob and this Brother Bob don't get along and Sister Denise is running interference, that stress is placed on her. That's pretty good. I don't care what anybody says. And we wonder why we're sick. And we wonder why we're feeble. And we wonder why there's no power in our lives. I can tell you why. You won't like it. But I don't know why preachers don't preach this. If you take communion unworthily, I'm not saying that's why people die. I'm not saying that's why people, that's the only reason why people die. The only reason people are sick. But that's one reason is they take communion unworthily, knowing that they're not right in their heart, knowing that they have all in their heart with one another, and they take it to save face in the church, yet they drink, they drink damnation to themselves. Thank you, Sister Paul. Boy, it's fun to come to church, isn't it? I, I wish to God I could not do this. I gotta tell you the truth, Sister Martha. I can't get up here and lie to you. I can't get up here and just spring is here. Here's a flower. I, I want to. I, I want to. I really do. I mean, I, I say that everybody looks at me like a liar. I, re I really do. But I gotta tell you the truth. Why is there so many sickly among you and weak and die early? Scripture says it's because we take communion unworthily. But no preacher preaches it because nobody wants to come hear that. Nobody wants to hear that. I'm not going to sell, I'm not going to sell a million books on don't take communion unworthily. It's not going to happen. It's not. But if we eat the bread and we take it, drink the cup and we know that there's something in our life we've not given over to the Lord, then it takes our strength. It, the Bible says strictly, it, 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 uh, it brings damnation to you. I don't even remember where it's at. I have not, none of this is in my notes. I, I'm off track. I've, I've lost my bearings. I don't know where I'm at. But just hear me that we've got to understand that things happen in our lives that have got to change us. And no matter what's going on in our lives, we have to understand that God is still God. And we can walk away from Him and we can walk away from church. We can do whatever we want to do. But He's still calling you. He still loves you, no matter where you've been, no matter what you're doing. He still loves you. And He's still calling out for you. How long, how long will Jesus have to suffer us? 1 Thessalonians 4.18, we ought to all know that. 1 Thessalonians 4.18. Hallelujah. Because Jesus says, or Scripture says, we're to comfort each other with these words. Let's go back to 17. Sorry, my fault. And we share lives and we be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Verse 18. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. <clears throat> what words? That I'm going to be caught up to meet him in the clouds. He's going to come get me. He's coming for a church that's glorious. He's coming for a church without spot or without wrinkle. He's coming for a church that's on its way to heaven. He's, he's, he's coming for a church that's looking for him to come. He says to, he says to comfort one another with these words. What words? He's coming. He's coming. I'm going home. I'm ready. Are you ready? Has Christ been made Lord of your life? 
Has Jesus Christ been made the king of your kingdom? Has he been made the Lord of your area, your life and your life? Has he been, has he been made the, the top commander of everything in your life? Are you ready? Is he your savior? Is he your savior? Listen, we've got to stop the church game and start living for Jesus. But I, let's, please understand, I'm not angry with any of you. I'm not disappointed in you. I, I thank God for this church. I thank God for you, the people of this church. And you're wonderful, wonderful people. But I just want us to go forward with God. I want us to be mature Christians. Amen. You know what a mature Christian is? Someone who doesn't get their feelings hurt every time somebody says, doesn't say hi to you when they walk by. I think they need to shake my hand. Who cares? You didn't shake theirs either. It's so stupid to me. Well, they, they came in, didn't say nothing to me. Did you say anything either? No? Then why are you mad? They don't make a lick of sense to me. I just don't get it. Somebody please help me so I can be mad. I mean, I, I just, I don't understand. I just don't get it. We've got to quit the church game. It's not about church. It's not Jesus. It's about being saved. It's about being ready. It's about being on my way to heaven. And the journey gets sweeter every day. I'm walking with Jesus, talking with Jesus all along the way. My soul gets so happy. I shout and I sing at night. I'm on my way to heaven. And the journey gets sweeter every day. I, I just... That's no Jimmy Swagger song, right? So, okay. I don't know. I, don't know. But I just want to share with you that <coughs> Jesus was thirsty for home. The young man who left his living, he left everything, he was thirsty to go home. Thirsty to go home. Jesus, how long must I suffer you? I'm ready to go home. God said, comfort each other with these words. And in a moment, it's wiggling of eye, the of God shall sound. Arise, the dead Christ will rise first. We're going to meet him in the clouds. Because we ought to be thirsty to go home. We don't belong here. That's another sermon for another time, for another hour. I just want to, I want you to get this in your spirit. I'm not here to, to make up a residence. I'm here to be a warrior and a, and a, and a, and a person for God. I, I, I'm here to be a disciple. I'm, I'm placed here for a reason. I'm supposed to go forth and make disciples. I'm not, God never, he never instructed me to dig a well, to make a homestead. He said that we are pilgrims in this, in this land. We are not of this world. We are in the world, but we're not of this world. My residence is not here. My residence is in a new heaven, a new Jerusalem. That's where my residence is set up. I'm just here to be a disciple maker. And we ought to thirst and hunger to go home. I'm kind of homesick for a country to which I've never been before. Does that make sense to anybody? I hope, I, I, no sad goodbyes. Time won't matter anymore. Beulah Land. Sweet Beulah Land. Anybody know those songs? I know I'm old, but I know those songs, man. I, I, the sweet Beulah Land. I'm kind of homesick for a country to which I've never been before. Does that make any sense to anybody? I love that. There's a, there's a table spread in splendor and there's someone standing by an open door. My wife sings that song. Lord, I've never been this homesick before. See the bright light shine. It's just about home time. I can see my father standing at the door. This whole world has been a wilderness, but I'm ready for deliverance. Lord, I've never been this homesick before. There's a light in the window. Table spread in splendor. 
Someone's standing by. An open door, is that right? <laughs> I don't remember all the words. Yeah, I can see a crystal river, so I must be near forever. Lord, I've never seen, never been this homesick before. Bump, bump, see the bright light shine. It's just about home time. I can see my father standing at the door. This old world has been just singing it. And I'm there, I'm ready for deliverance. Lord, I've never been this home sick before. Boom, boom, see the bright light shine. It's just about home time. And I can't see my father standing at the door. This whole world has been a wilderness. And I'm ready for the living. See my family, their faces all big. <laughs> Other people anymore. Oh, I love that old song. It's true. It's time we get thirsty to go home. It's time that home sounds good to us. I'm not saying, don't you walk out of this place and say, Brother Jesse, we gotta get ready to die. That's not what I said. That's not what I said. What I said is it ought to be important to you to go home. It ought to make you thirst and hunger for home. To a place I've never been before. Because I want to be with Jesus. Everybody says heaven is golden streets and gates of pearl and all that junk, whatever. And I heard a preacher say it. I'm not going to take credit for saying it, but I'll say this. So it doesn't matter if the streets are hit deep in mud and the, and the gates are wooden and, and open on leather hinges. As long as Jesus is there, it'll be heaven to me. As long as my Jesus is there, it will be heaven to me. It doesn't matter if the mansions are little shanties and the lean-to against the barn. As long as Jesus is there, it will be heaven to me. I don't know how you are today. I don't know what your life is like. And you can, like I said, you can fool me, but you can't fool God. You can like me, you can hate me, you can love me, whatever, it doesn't matter. As long as you are still living for the Lord, that's all that matters. Have you given your heart to Jesus? Have you given your life to Him? But here's the, here's the trick. Everything I preach to you tonight, if you're not saved, you're disqualified. Because you'll not be going in a rapture. You'll be not going to a city four square where the streets are gold and the gates are pearl. That will not be your home. Though you will live forever, you will not be in the presence of God. You'll be in the presence of your God. They called him Lucifer when he was an archangel. They called him Satan. In Revelation, they called him that old dragon, the devil. He will be who you will spend eternity with. Hell is hot and it's for a long time and the worm dieth not. There'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth and cries to someone just dip their finger in water and touch it to my tongue because I am tormented in this flame not trying to scare you just trying to tell you your options I could go live with Jesus the one who died for me the one who gave me life and life more abundant I can go live with him forever and ever and I can be in the presence of the Lord in the presence of my family or else I can be separated from God never to know his love again only the torment of the flame and the screams and the cackles of the demonic host the taming 
laid hold of what is rightfully theirs, your soul, because if you don't give your soul to the Lord, it does belong to the devil. There is no plan B. It's God or the devil. There is no gray area. It's up to you. Where do you want to live? Where do you want to be? It's a no-brainer for me. I don't even have to be real smart to figure that out. I don't want to burn forever. Oh, that place isn't even real. You don't have to believe in it to go there. The rapture is just Christians just trying to get out. You don't have to believe in a rapture to miss it. I'm just ready to go. I'm thirsting for home. I'm ready for home. It's in my office all afternoon. Crying and praying. And listen, I don't like preaching when I preach this morning. That's hard for me. I don't care if it's the truth or not. When you're up here, you're the one up here and they're looking at you like, you sorry. Okay? And it's hard for me. That's hard for me. A lot of preachers like to preach people into hell and leave them there. That's not me. I like to give you a way out. <laughs> I say, you know, there's, there's a way out. But some preachers like to take it and, and abuse the sheep. That's God's word, it's not mine. He like to rule over them. That's not me. It's hard for me. To come tell you that if you don't get your life right, that's sparkling hard. But telling you the things in our life. When I went through the laundry list of things that are in the church, and I know they are. Because believe it or not, I do pray. I do know some stuff. I'm not, I'm not willing to go pull you out of the aisle and embarrass you. But I know some stuff. And I know I know. Because I am the pastor here, whether you like it or don't like it. And God does reveal things to me. Amen. He does show me some stuff. He does show me what's going on in some of your lives. Whether you like that or not, I'm sorry. But hear me. When I read that laundry list of things, and it doesn't move us, that bothers me. When, when here we go again. When the altars aren't full and you know inside your heart that laundry list there's some of that stuff in and the altars don't fill up, that bothers me. It bothers me. Because I'll not sit my tail in on a pew I'll not sit here to save face with you. I love you, but I could care less what you think of me. I love you. If that stuff's in my life, I'm going to an altar. I'm pouring my soul out because you can't help me. You can't change me. You can't bless me. You can't make me whole. But God can't. And I'll not sit on a padded pew and worry about what everybody else thinks about me if I get up off of a pew and go to an altar. I'll go from here to an altar. It doesn't bother me. Because you matter to God. And it matter, you matter to me. And all, and all that stuff. I love you. I love you. i got to say this right or you're going to get mad at me. And I'm going to misunderstand what I say. I love you. And I do care about you. But I'll not save face with you. I'll not uh, worry so much about what you think of me that I won't go get something right. Yeah. Because these are the places that I go when it's time to get things right. And it doesn't bother me to walk in front of you and say, I need help, God, because listen, you're just lying and saying you don't. I know you guys have it all together, but there's a lot of times I don't. And there's a lot of times I spend here by myself getting some stuff right. Because I've got to get some stuff right. 
I can't lead you where I've never been. I can't lead you unless I can get some stuff right. I can't be hateful and gripe, gripey and whatever and lead you to loving each other. So I have to spend time right here on my face before God. To God, please forgive me and take that stuff out of my life. But I'll not sit on a pew and worry about what you think of me. I'm going to take David's attitude. I've not yet, to, I've not even defiled myself yet. You've not even seen me defile myself. I'm going to dance before the Lord. I'm going to play a keyboard and jump up and down. And I'm not going to be real religious. You'll just have to forgive me. But when I think about His goodness and what He's done for me, when I think about His goodness and how He set me free, I'm going to dance, 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 dance for my Lord. I, 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 the religiosity just leaves me. I, I, you guys just have to just get used to it. I'm going to take my coat off. I'm not going to wear a tie. I'm going to sweat. And I'm going to have pit stains. And that's just how it is. Okay, and I'm just going to come to the altar and I'm going to cry. And when I preach, I'm going to cry. Yes. And I'm going to keep you longer than 15 minutes. Yes, amen. And I'm going to preach to you. And tell you what God's telling me in my heart for you. Because I love you. If I didn't love you, I sure... Listen, it's been an easy gig if I didn't love you. You know what I'd do? I'd come give you a book report for 40 minutes and leave and take my offering and go home. And I wouldn't be back again until next Sunday. It would be, be an easy gig if I didn't care about you. If I didn't care what God thought. But I care about what God thinks. And I care about what God thinks about you. And I care where God's taking us. There's a lot of preachers that will just preach their 40-minute sermon, take their offering, and go home. And they've got it out of a book. They got it off somewhere else. They didn't even spend any time with God to, to, to do anything with it. Don't look at me like that. You know it's true. You know it's true. I don't want to have a 45-minute bless me club. Let's go home. I want you to be blessed. True. I want you to be excited about God. Yes. I want you to be, woohoo, let's go. Yeah, thank God. Yeah. Let's do it. Let's do it because you can do it. I have faith and confidence in you. I know that you can do it. If God would have placed you here, if you couldn't do it, I know you can. And I don't want you to be beat down either. That's not my point. That's not what I'm trying to get you to understand. Please understand me. I'm not trying to beat you down. I'm trying to lift you up. I'm trying to lift your spirits up to know that God himself loves you so much. Amen. He loves you so very much. And he desires something from you. He desires your life. Because he can't do anything with people who hang on to their own life. Yes, Scripture says, and this is my last one off with. Scripture says, where are you going, boy? No. Oh. Come here. Go. Scripture says, he's on. Go, go to mom. Go to mom. Scripture says, what are you doing? <laughs> What's wrong with you? Uh, he was running. The scripture says, He who hangs on to his life shall lose it. And he who loses his life shall save it. If you want to hang on to your life, God can't do anything with you. If you want to give him your life, the things he will do for you. How big is your God? How big is your God? See that horizon? He's beyond that one. See that horizon? He's beyond that one. See how far that is? How far, how far you can see? He's, he's past there. See the bend is in the atmosphere. See the bend of the, of the earth? He's past there. How big is your God? Somebody ought to just say, how big is your God? How big is your God tonight? That's how big he is. If you will stand to your feet with me tonight. I told you I wouldn't keep you super long. I did good.